Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 16 of Roll Off a Tangent podcast. And today we have Nikki and Rob and XJ, and we are discussing the story, The Mare Frigoris Culture by somebody called Robert Gibson. So let's get into it. I have been volunteered by the rest of the <laughs> staff here. <laughs> To give you <laughs> a summary like a of the short it, it story. It didn't happen kind of exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It is truthful so and I have nothing against truthful accounts. <laughs> you see? Exactly, guys. Exactly. Okay. Right. So, um, the Mari Frigoris culture was written by our own Rob Gibson. And it is... Actually, I don't know whether to just start in on the story or whether to give a synopsis because uh, I'll try to stay objective just initially. The story is set on the moon. And what is very, very interesting about it is that it's set in the year objective, 1543. Remember. What's no, that? No, objective. No, no. Objective. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. In the year 1543. And there are a bunch of Italians. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, I guess, of the story. Yeah, that's that's that, that's a that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of Italians. I don't know what you're going to say next, so I don't know if I should go to my legal speak yet. So I'll just not say anything. So this bunch of Italians, this group of Italians, have settled on the moon, uh, and they have been there for forty years. So they settled on the moon in fifteen zero three, right? Mm. Fifteen and three A.D right and uh the problem is that they were they are there and they are being consumed by an ennui a lethargy and they seem to have lost all initiative how did they get there well this is one of the int one of the interesting parts of the story is that they got there because leonardo da vinci managed to decipher managed to find and decipher <laughs> the uh documents in a cache uh, that led to the discovery of m lunar technology, and he used that lunar technology to be able to take an expedition to the moon. Only one group of people survived. They've been there for 40 years. I know, they've been there for 40 years. Uh, and what is going to happen to them? It follows the story of a, a young man, a student called Armando, and what happens to him when he dares take that one step that all of the other inhabitants of Base Uno refuse to take? And and it was just a mind blowing tale. How's that, guys? Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Love the way you <laughs> roll your R's with the <laughs> Italians. <laughs> I mean, it was an advertisement of a kind for sure. <laughs> Um, so, mm -hmm. R Rob, actually, can you tell us what made you write this story? Because I, mm. I'm so curious. I've long had a thing about the moon. Uh, in fact, the, the places in the solar system I feel most drawn to are the moon and Mercury and uh, Ceres, the asteroid. I like kind of bare, rocky places with supposedly no life on them, and yet... They seem, as it were, lambent or, or um, what's the word, immanent with, with a kind of something that is life, although it's not organic. Uh, haunted, I suppose, is the word. Anyway, another factor in the story is that when I was six years old, I think it must have been for my birthday, my mum gave me a pictorial encyclopedia and on pages 68 and 69 i think it was there were artists impressions of the surfaces of the planets and the big central picture was a picture of the moon uh, a landscape on the moon as seen through a spaceship this was 1958 so it was the good old kind of moon with nice pointy uh mm. downturns and you know Real um, chesty bone style yes. illustrations. Yes, yeah. I suppose so, although even more, uh, even more picturesque than that. And uh, it was all bathed in in a kind of bluish earth light. And I didn't realise I was I was only six. I didn't realise that it was just reflected light from the earth. I thought that the moon's surface really might be that colour. It seemed really magical 
to me. Um, so that was the second. That was that was one aspect of it. I suppose that's partly why I've got this thing about the moon. Now there was a rather unsatisfactory story which I read much later, just a few pages long, by Paul Anderson called The Light. And it just has a, a 20th century standard first mission to the moon by some Americans and they're trudging around on the moon and they see a footprint, one of them sees a footprint, and for no particular reason that I can tell, the the narrator suggests that this human footprint must have been made by the only person who was brainy enough to get to the moon before then, i.e. Leonardo da Vinci. Now, I I rejected that story because that is ridiculous because there was no technological base for Leonardo to build a spaceship on. But much later, I thought, yes, but supposing he found the technology which had been left there by... Uh, travellers to earth by alien travellers to earth he wouldn't have been able to invent uh, the technology himself but he might have been the only person in the world who could have interpreted it and used it so that's the idea i i used for this story brilliant well okay guys i throw it open who would like to go first uh I, I mean, hearing the uh, backstory for how you came up with the um, the uh, concept for the short story made it makes a lot more sense now. I, I mean, I have to admit, when I was reading it, I had difficulty trying to piece together um, what everything was going, uh, what was going on, especially during the first part of the story. So it was. Um, um, the first part of the story actually moved a little bit slowly for me because I'm like still trying to figure out um, uh, what mm -hmm. was going on. And then there were three different factions as far as I could re I could see. There was the uh, there was the forty uh, Italians uh, in I don't know how do you say it? base uno uh, yeah. the moon base, uh, and then. Uh, there were the uh, the people who crashed, uh, and then there yeah. was the brazen the brazen ones. Um, so yeah. so so the whole thing was actually quite confusing to me until all the way to the end, uh, where it started to make a little bit more sense. And then now you start talking about it, and then um, uh, the whole story clicked for me. I, I have to say, it's quite, I would really love to know more about the brazen ones, uh, for one thing. Um, mm. I mean, the story, the short story you wrote practically backs for a sequel. Um, mm. uh, I, I, I did think that there were some things that were a little bit hard to... There were some things that were a little bit hard to swallow for me, which is that they've, on, they've only been in a base for 40 years uh, and then they kind of forgotten uh, a whole bunch of stuff uh, from before. Um, like, the, the way the story read to me is that they've kind of lo lost connection to the uh, founder. Um, not Leonardo himself, but uh, there was a uh, uh, Senor Capuana. Do you mean? No, no. So, so, so this is where it starts getting a little bit fuzzy for me because I couldn't make out what was what was connected to whom. But there were a group of people that came before them to build Base Uno. <laughs> Uh, not really, not really. They they were the people who who built it, and um, and lived in it. But they were expecting, I suppose, other expeditions expeditions to come. Mm. But they the only other expedition that got there crashed, and there were no survivors. So mm. in mm. Arzeuna was left on its own, mm. and they don't they didn't know whether the founder himself was on that second expedition or not. 
Mm. I mean, we we know that he wasn't because he he died later on on Earth, but right. they weren't to know. There's no radio communication in those days. Right. You see. Yeah. yeah. So I I think for me, uh, the feel of the story is as if this group of people had been separated from the main group of people for like a few hundred years. So it was a bit of a it was a it threw me off a little bit to know that uh, it was only 40 years had passed. So, I mean, could just be my personal preference kind of thing. But it would have made more sense to me if it, if a couple of centuries had passed, or at least that was the way the story was mm-hmm. presented, the feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did like the... Uh, I did really like the, uh, the little bit of attention to detail you put in where they thought this earth was 6,000 years old because that was around the time when uh, the bishop who I can't remember his name the bishop who originally <laughs> made, yeah, yeah who originally made the uh, calculations d- came up with the idea and I was like oh that's, <laughs> a, that's a very nice stroke amongst all the other clues so to speak you literally said uh, year 15 whatever uh, Anno Domini to place a time but the 6,000 year uh, uh, length of time for the, the creation of the world like the world history really solidified the feeling that this bunch of Italians uh, on the moon is, uh, is uh, from that period in time yeah, yeah. but um yeah, I just, I just, I just, you just, you had done a really, you have written a really fascinating thing for the brazen ones, and I really want to know more. So, yeah, that's my take. Yeah. Nikki. Nikki? Yeah, you are not getting out of this, so. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, I just, you know what? You, you're just like just keeping quiet. Yeah. Well, you guys were talking. What what is I was supposed to say? You know what? Now it's my time. Or what? Yeah, totally jump in. Okay. Man. Right. So, um what a story. Ah. That's the type of uh, stuff I like. Um crazy concepts, uh, incredible like sort of attention to detail, fantastical characters that that seem to say more than what they are actually saying, right? Great fiction. Um and uh, it took me a couple of times to really understand it. I, I read through it three times, uh, twice, um, uh, like in the same sitting and then once uh, again alone. Um, and I really, really like the story uh, because, um, you know, I wouldn't read it three times if, if I didn't want to. I usually just read something twice for the, for the uh, podcast. But today I read it three times. So um, I like the character of the the young boy who, uh, you know, he is starting to to feel things like a you know a, more of a grown up, right? Like he he understands the psychology like of his relationship with this uh, other girl, right? On a really profound level. Uh, which which made him very interesting to me, right? So it's like a kid who uh, grew up in this um, whole um, aspect of honor and vigilancy and you know how you should rightly think because he's being scholared by these professors, right? Um, so that added a lot of flavor for me. I also really enjoyed the uh, the ending. I think the whole fact that. Uh, these moon men were always there, just waiting. And then they finally came out, and it wasn't a terrible disaster, like everyone thought. Instead, it it may be a hopeful way towards the future. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, I, I'd never, I'd never write like a story uh, that that ends in such a nice way. I just can't. It's not in my blood, like. <laughs> So I can appreciate it when I see something I can't do because I'm just awful. Like my 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 stories never end in a I, happy I, way for anybody. I'm gonna jump in here because I'm not as polite as Nikki. Uh, so pardon me, but I 
maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it seems the ending seems seemed a little bit horrifying to me. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yes, actually, really? I agree with XJ with that one really? because you talk you spoke about you know that there was death but without oblivion. It, right. it, it, because the way I read it, end. like the brazen ones were assimilating um, mm. the the really. Yeah. I I read it as I read it as like hopeful frontier of the future, like you know the ending of the nineteen fifties sort of like. Well, uh, it was hopeful for the brazen ones, right? But for the humans, because they were asleep, well, well, and then all, suddenly all the, when like, they, they woke up on the moon, what's the alternative? Yeah, like, you know yeah. and. And I kind of thought, oh, wow. So the gnome, right, the gnomes, the brazen ones, are going to assimilate humanity, whether they like it or not. They say, well, you can go back to your to your base if you like. Um, you know, the power pack there is going to last for 500 years. And I don't know whether that was a veiled threat or not. Yes. You've only got half a millennia ah. before you need to, you know, to really come to the party here. Right. Yeah. And I like this much okay. more. This is this is, this is crazy. Okay, is this what you meant, Rob? Which one did you mean? Yeah. The which one, one did you or... mean, Rob? It's it's not so much the the brazen ones, but the, the 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 empty suits are going to, if you like, assimilate the humans who put them on. Mm. Or to put it another way, um, merging with with these spacesuits is a way of prolonging your life indefinitely on on the moon and so you sort of join the brazen ones it's not so much that they are assimilating you the individuals aren't doing that but that you're joining them you're being able to live like they like they mm. do but there is there is an element of uh, of underlying coercion here because they didn't ask Right. I mean, you know, um, Armando, Luisa, okay, they they suddenly fell asleep. And then when they woke up, they knew all of these things. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a they, lot like... They, it's they didn't lot. really have a choice. It's a lot mm. like the Borgs when I read it. I was like, man, this is so Borg-like. Yeah. It's a benevolent Borg, I thought of. And then right at the end, you actually say that they will merge with the landscape. Right, they will merge with the rocks and everything, and in which case I'm going, oh, oh, hold on, just a second here, right? So it starts off, and it's sort of, you know, it goes one way, and then it kind of zigs, and you kind of go, oh wow, brace, oh wow, and then it goes into the suits, and you go, oh huh. crap, and then suddenly you go to the, oh, but then you only have 500 years, dudes. Yeah. And then well, this this is this is going to be your future whether you like it or not. And I thought, oh wow, that's interesting. The fact that you got this out of the story, and I got peaceful ending. <laughs> um, that's I mean we have to discuss this. But Rob, you want to say something? Yeah, please. I just want to say that uh, I, I really disclaim all, all responsibility. It's just my, <laughs> my subconscious uh, is, is throwing up. All no, no disclaiming of responsibility, yeah, Rob. No. This, this is yeah. We don't allow that kind of things. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, okay. Tell us uh, what you really mean. Yeah. Yes. Uh, subconscious or otherwise. Well, I, I, I'm a sort of slave to to what. The mind, my mind throws up. You see, I just have to write it down. Um, yeah. But uh, also, uh, I've got good uh, precedent for this because uh, Michelangelo, no less, said that uh, uh, you know he it wasn't he wasn't really doing his sculptures. He was just clearing away the the, the, the chipping away so as to allow the the shape to to reveal itself. You see, so. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing, but uh, I would like, I would like to say that I think um, both interpretations are right. The optimistic Nikki one and the less optimistic Cousin XJ one. It just depends <laughs> how you look at it. That's um, dodging, man. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to prove either of us wrong. Look, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. I, I don't it's, think. You any three of us would be upset if uh, our, mm. our, our way is not the correct way. I wouldn't mind. I think I'll just sit there and be like, okay, all right. I'm in. It's the Terminator. I got it. Awesome. This is terrible. Let's let's fight the suits. Uh, right. 
So you see, the, here is the I thing. I mean, yeah. Go, Rob. So, well, I was just going to say that uh, if I were in the place of these people in Barza Uno, I might, in the end, decide, oh heck. I might as well wear the suit and become a, a moon man. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's probably less boring than just sitting around in Barze Uno for the rest of my life. Okay, you see, because I'll tell you what gave me, and perhaps this also gave XJ that impression, is that I'm just reading it now. And the, the penultimate sentence says, the sentience that bled away into the environment would tenuously persist, soaked in brooding plains and frowning rocks, right? So the sentience, we're talking about the sentience of, of the what, what we initially assumed to be the lunar inhabitants plus the human inhabitants together. And then that is reinforced in the very last sentence by saying, perhaps, not yes, but perhaps a good end, which of course that one word perhaps has a whole lot of ambiguity that you can then read into it and track backwards, right? Perhaps mm -hmm. a good end, undeniably a static end. And whenever you say static to a human being, that's not necessarily a positive thing. Human beings tend not to like any stasis, right? Mm. They like more dynamism. Undeniably mm. a static end, the final adaptation, merger, death, death without oblivion. So in that last sentence alone, you've got a lot of, of keywords that denote ambiguity, that denote uh, sort of some kind of negativity. And so I think maybe that's what XJ and I were picking up on yeah, when yeah. we were coming to our conclusion. There is yeah. that, but also for me, like the concept itself of, uh, merging with a spacesuit uh, that's already been inhabited by a bunch of other things. Uh, it just seemed like uh, not your typical um, happily ever after ending, mm. you know? You, you, you never read mm. Spider-Man? <laughs> uh, you know, Venom? He, yes. Pretty great. Yeah, but he got out of that pretty quick. Yeah, but then some other guy got it, and I think he's uh, better off. That, he could just do whatever he wants with it. Yeah, like, this sounds. Uh, I don't know. I, mm. I would just would not if if this thing can let me like walk in space. I'm pretty sure it can let me do other things too. So like I'm not I mean, staying on so, the moon. So I mean, I'm the go sense somewhere. the sense that I got is that you wouldn't even necessarily have a physical body anymore. Like you'd be not uh, just a, you you'd be dissoluted into the spacesuit because okay. the spacesuit had previous inhabitants but they're not there anymore yeah so mm. I, I like my my version more and more <laughs> yeah. i'm not sure if the spacesuits if all the spacesuits had been worn or if the, some of them were just spares I, I kind of thought that the ones that had the brazen ones in them the small ones the ones that hadn't been enlarged to fit humans uh were you know, they, they were filled, but the, the others were probably just empty spares, which had been used by the humans uh, earlier, 40 years ago, when setting up the base, and then just put away with their potential un, unexploited. Uh, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know everything you see. The, my subconscious doesn't tell me everything. You see, I, I have a question, and the th the other thing that struck me when reading the story was the, the lethargy, the ennui that the inhabitants were feeling after 40 years of setting that up the That was base. exactly what I was going to ask next. Right. Like, yeah, and the thing... Yeah. But, you know, it, it, was it or was it because all of the technology that they were using was not human technology? It was alien technology. Well, did you mean to draw some kind of philosophical line between human invention versus non-human invention versus the motivation or the interest or the energy therefore put into that sort of technology? Well, I, I just thought that... The only way to survive in that closed-in environment for so long, and life life expectancy was lower in those days, I suppose, so most of the original um, generation probably died out. Most of them had been born on the moon, I should think, um, or, or were very young when they went there. But uh, the... Um, 
uh, putting myself in their place, I imagine that the only way to survive would be to to adopt a, a sort of very low profile and en- energy wise. And apart from that, of course, the atrophy of the muscles involved in in one sixth Earth's gravity for decade for decades would also create the the lethargy, um, hmm. the la languida, which are called it. Well, mm. interesting. Here okay. I thought. Here I thought because I I also thought that it was some kind of uh, influence from uh, alien technology. Yeah, mm. it was just hopelessness, really. But they 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 took the, the the best probably what was the best way out for their mental health, which was just to intense intense relaxation and and not thinking too much and you know okay now i'm i'm gonna have to so like i i I also (laughs) noticed some themes not the themes that you guys are thinking of but i thought that like it's funny it's funny that uh nikki is more optimistic than Cass. yes yeah i know (laughs) yeah this one's a turn up for the book i'm used to winning (laughs) oh you're used to winning oh Good stuff. All right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue. Let, let me tell you. <laughs> so, um, I thought, all right. So, I thought that hidden behind this this beautiful story uh, could also be some sort of like a parallel to, if you wanted to read into it, it could be crazy. But I was not thinking of like alien influence or anything like that. I was thinking more about a psychological thing because people keep drawing on, on the walls. And... <laughs> You know, uh, the first thing you think about when you think of like a, an insane asylum is you think of right. like everything is drawn on the on the places, right? Mm. Or you think of a monastery. You think of a place of worship. You think of a cave where people have drawn the first thing they've seen, right? Like these archaeological sites. Like this is mm. like an expression of, of humanity because they have nothing else uh, to express themselves in, right? There's those of, both of those can be like argued if you'd like, but I prefer the the second option. I prefer the idea that this is just like history in the making. This is what happened to these people. And when we, you know, the mercenaries, I know Skyrocket or whatever his name would be, you know, he goes down on that moon, and you will see all of this has happened. You know, this is history in the making. This is what mm. happened on the moon. Mm. So you're saying that there's a thin line between between sacred and insanity yeah of course yeah. but i mean isn't that always so yeah i uh, i i assumed that it was it was one of the few amusements open to them would be to draw on these blank walls uh using materials which weren't actually meant for artistic purposes but you know they they were clever enough to to use them for that uh, I, I don't think these people are insane. It, it's it, they're, they're they're just they would go they would have gone insane if they hadn't had the the sense to uh, go sort of half asleep most of the time. I, right, I put right. Them narcoleptic, you know. And I'm not saying that that had to be the um, how to, how to say it like the intention that you had behind it that it would be insane. But it's good that people could read into something that they would themselves enjoy, right? So Kaz and uh, XJ, they've created a bubble around the story where they took the things that they thought like stood out and then they yeah. sort of created these little ribbons around them and now the story is theirs and they've told yeah. it and this is how it looks to them. And that's beautiful, yeah. right? That's how people take yeah. your stories. Yeah, that's good. And And if people can actually start quarreling about what the story means then that shows that uh, you know it's it's really it's really arrived you know in the corpus of of literature i would like to see a prequel not a sequel i i think uh, yeah the sequel for me is you know i could take it or leave it but i would yeah give my eye teeth for a prequel to this story leonardo da vinci finding the cash yeah yeah it has to be uh, uh, yeah what do you call him? Leonardo from Vinci? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, what Leonardo the, from Vinci. That's what the da means. Yeah. yeah, that's what the da means. That's right. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you're a cooker than me, Rob. <laughs> um, so yeah, Leonardo da Vinci uh, getting the cash of, of these crazy aliens. 
Uh, yeah. that, that would have been the crescendo <laughs> like, to actually see that in the story. So a prequel has to be there, uh, Robert. So we we're right. expecting that. Yeah, <laughs> together with some Italian court intrigue. Yeah, Ooh. totally. Because it has Mixed to be in. believable, oh, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'd be mm -hmm. writing a historical novel and then the challenges. <laughs> yeah, yes. And then the yes. challenges of getting a group of Italians up into the moon and blah, blah, blah. You see, you've done it now, Rob. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you something. I'd really, really like to have the right kind of temperament to write a historical novel. Um, but I can imagine myself just panicking after the first paragraph or two and thinking, oh, have I got this right? Have I got this right? It's, it's no, I don't know how people do it. I mean, um, the, Robert E. Howard of Conan story fame, he was very good at it. And I don't know how he does it, but he's he's written... Um, I've got a book of his novellas uh, that were all published in a magazine called Oriental Tales, called The Sowers of the Thunder. And they are excellent stories, and they're um, oh, mind-bogglingly... I mean, I, obviously, I can't check all the details, but it, they all have the ring of truth. They all have the ring of historical truth. I couldn't do that. Um, if I did it, it would creak, you know. It would... <laughs> it would sound like oh yes he's 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 showing. done the research you yes, know here yeah. it is he's shoehorning it all because they say the same thing about me yeah really <laughs> who says the same thing about you no they would if i were to do an historical it would right. be like that as well mm. yeah i would i would be paralyzed with fear actually like yeah no. sometimes uh, seriously you, know, you just have to i actually i actually thought uh Old Friends was uh, written in a fairly comfortable manner because it was very clear to me that um, it was based off uh, something uh, mm. real that you only just changed the names of and shifted things around. It was very clear to me, like um, mm. that the oh, sense wow. of the sense of fam familiarity was very strong. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, it, it was. Uh, it was that archetypes again, I think. Yeah, that's, it was, that's it was yeah. Like medievalism sort of thing. Mm. So I think uh, I think uh, if you take a step, it wouldn't creak that loudly. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, well, you know, but I shouldn't have said that because I can see Nikki's brain ticking over, and he's going, "Hmm, got to remember that for Kaz's next short short story from." Hmm, I could. Yeah, you see, I can put that. Oh, I'll hand you something that you'll be. Oh, like, what oh do I do I'm with this? sure you will. That's sir. it. The war, the war is yes, not over. I may exactly. have lost the battle. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, back back to back to the story. <laughs> All right. So uh, my story, the delegators. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you know the story. Um, the idea of the prequel sounds really fun to me. Um, you know, it it sounds a lot more uh, adventurous than what we got to see in uh, in this one. So it might even have a different style, right? But I can clearly see that there is like a setup. Something really great happened to get people on the moon so early. Right. Mm. So it would be a great story to see. I doubt if it will happen, though. <laughs> well. Oh, no. Well, Robert, don't disappoint us like that, Rob. You uh, see, I, let me tell you the story of the Rock of Shimon. But one time, <laughs> the Rock author, of Shimon. Yes, that's right. An author of mine in the previous episode, <laughs> perhaps maybe the, the last episode, they said to me that something is nothing. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if if you want it to be done right, you should write it, or I'll write it. Mm. <laughs> now that's a, ti a time bomb to kick right, right here. Right, Rob I'm, is going I'm, to. I'm I mean, yeah, relieved. yeah. I'm very relieved that you three have reacted uh, so positively to the story because I had serious doubts about it, um, which was why I started tinkering with the ending. I thought it was kind of getting waffly, and and the. Um, that's the kind of kiss of death to this kind of story if it starts to get too waffly because you're dealing with so many strange themes that mm. it, there's a danger it'll all puddle down into into just uh, unidentifiable strangeness. And well, I, wanted, I wanted that not to happen. To be brutally honest, yeah. uh, 
it's the I I feel it's the beginning that you should uh, tinker uh, tinker with wow. because wow. that was the part that was very very uh, confusing for me anyway confusing to work mm-hmm. through like mm-hmm. once once uh, you once uh, Ama- Ar- I can't roll my R's that way Armando went into the basement to find the spacesuits then the things become a lot clearer Aru, Aru, Mando, whatever. Uh, that, that sounds like a Mortal Kombat character. <laughs> well, um, interesting what you say, anyway. Yeah, but it was it was really the beginning that I had to uh, I had to seriously work through. That was the part that was uh, most uh, cognitively uh, intensive effort for me because I was like trying to figure out what what is what. Um, it it didn't help that that were I I thought at first that they were based on the moon, and then uh, it then seemed as if uh, not really uh, they seem to be uh, it's not really the moon because there was another faction that's on the moon and I was like, wondering what's what's what, and then there was a reference to the Earth and. I got really confused around that, and I think, um, mm. and then trying to decipher whether, uh, like, for the longest time, I thought this was not um, the f- the the fifteen hundreds, and I was like wondering why these people were thinking that the Earth is six thousand years old. I was all it was it was quite. It was quite. Um, there were a lot of very separate threads that were that were trying to come together, and I thought the the beginning uh, needs some tinkering rather than the end. But that's just my thought. Ah, I'll have to. I'll have to look into that. You see, now for me, it was completely different because I have read some crap short stories in my time. <laughs> well, you've read one, so that makes sense. <laughs> So what I tend to do is when I read short stories is that I just zip through it because I just assume that it's going to be bad and you're going to have to convince me otherwise. All right. Okay. Yeah. Arrogance. Okay. I'll cop to that. All right. So this is what I do. So it's just now I just look at it and go, oh, it's a short story. Okay. So speed to 1.5 to 2.0. Let's go. Right. And I went through it and it came up and it was, okay, 1543. Hmm. All right. Never mind. Who knows? Maybe he made a mistake. Hang it. Let's continue. Da 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 da. Forty years. Da da da. Leonardo da Vinci. And I went. Hold on. And at <laughs> that point, I went straight back to the beginning. And this time, I paid attention. Mm. And and the same thing happened with Conan, which I loved. Right. The same mm-hmm. thing happened with the Conan story. Right. And the same thing happened with the delegators. Okay, that's what I was going through, and it did. And until something hooks me, I really, really don't pay attention. So it was this data point, and that data point, and this other data point. And then I went, hold on a sec. Now I've got to put them all together. The premise is uh, is suitably intriguing for me to go back and pay attention. And then at that point, I do what I normally do with short stories. I'm really interested in. I go right back start again and this time i read for comprehension mm. and that's that's what i did that's what i did with yours nikki that's what i did with yours rob and that's what i did with rehs as well right and mm. and that's that's because you know geez time's too short to waste on a crappy short story mm. right yeah so, and uh, yeah probably you it definitely would, wouldn't want to waste your time on a crappy long novel <laughs> no no and you know yes exactly i mean you know uh, my husband says that he gives it uh, 100 pages. And if it doesn't make sense in 100 pages, then he'll just say, hang it. And, you know, it's a wall banger, basically. That, that's quite right. generous, that 100 pages. Yeah, 100 yeah. pages. Yeah. I, mm. That man must love to read. <laughs> I, I'm, going well, to be, I'm going to be brutally honest again, which is oh that God. if the first page doesn't make sense to me, I would put it aside. 
Mm. Yeah, because you see, short stories are a difficult beast, though, XJ, because there's some there's some setup, and you don't have a lot of room to maneuver. So I actually tend to give the authors the benefit of a doubt when it comes to a short story that I would not give them in a longer work. So I mean, you know, enough. but it's it's fair enough. It's theirs. It's theirs to throw away as they wish, though, right? So. <laughs> You know, and no, it's true. I mean, you know, these these are the things. That's why the oh short story God. is such an art form. I mean, not everybody can sit down and write a short story. Mm. People, uh, you know, a lot of writers are actually find it a lot easier to write a novel, as do I. I find it much easier to write a novel than to write a short story. Yeah, Same, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, I agree with that. It <laughs> takes a lot of skill to write a short story. So, you know, it's you're already you know, authors, you're already teetering on, on shifting sands here, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, you come and you put a short story in front of me, okay? And it's really guilty until proven innocent, mm. okay? And, I, and I'm very sorry about that, but that's, that's my own personal philosophy. Okay. Mm. Well, mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a more, let's say, open-ended way to say that. Uh, if... Like, if we were to speak of a lot of types of writing, right? We've got poems, we've got books, we have short stories, we have sagas, you know, we have multiple book series, so on and so forth. Um, short stories is probably, in my opinion, something that either you're going to sit down and you're going to be like, well, at least that was 15 minutes. Or you found something in such like that delivers its point in such a short amount of time and so cleverly that like it it gets you to think about stuff and gets you to write things and um you know really experience uh that concept that was just given to you right so it's it's an art form i think like a fantastical short story um mm -hmm. and a lot of good short stories don't even have that spark they're just really well written but there are some that uh, definitely um, take your breath away. Uh, Lost no, I, Hearts. I, I... Do you remember Lost Hearts, guys? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think Lost Hearts is well, a story like have, that. Uh, I'm, I can't remember if Cass, has, uh, uh, Cass joined us already by mm -hmm. when we did. No, no, no. I don't think, I don't think yeah. uh, you, she was there. Mm -hmm. um, I may well, have to revisit in that case. Lost Hearts. Uh, why don't you give the synopsis, Rob? Uh, Lost Hearts by M.R. James. Do you know M.R. James, Kaz? I don't think I do, actually. No. I'll, I'll write it here. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. It's a horror story. It's, it's a really gruesome horror oh, story. Okay. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Gruesome. Uh, oh, cool. A country squire <laughs> believes that he can get himself superpowers in some vaguely defined sense by cutting out the hearts of three children and mixing them in wine and drinking them. And he, he, he does this over a period of years with two children and, uh, you know, stray waifs and all that who won't be missed. And then the third one... Uh, the na narrative is from the point of the view of the third child and uh, the sort of disturbances in the in the atmosphere around the house by this time and uh, you you get the feeling that the previous victims of this person and of other similar um, people throughout the ages are congregating around the house to issue warnings and uh, it's really, really good and really, really spooky. And uh, in oh, the end, good! I'll read it. Yeah, yeah. You read it. I mean, don't don't let me spoil it by wittering on about it. Just just read it. Yeah, it's tremendous. I film. and okay. the thing is, I'm not even going to say what we discussed, uh, like what I said. But once again, in the, in that episode, it was like I had a theory of how I saw the story. And the two other gentlemen, XJ and Robert, <laughs> saw a different theory of how the story went. And when you know a story is good, it creates a dilemma like that, where it can be interpreted in multiple mm. ways. I mm -hmm. think it's the first thing that really snapped to me for the last parts. But also, like, uh, it really made me feel, uh, you know, 
the mm. the fear I had, but I I didn't have fear for if that would be me. I had the fear for the child that something could happen to this child. So yeah. Mm. Oh, that, cool. Okay, I shall definitely most definitely read. That but one. but back to Leonardo da Vinci and the moon. <laughs> uh, yes, Leonardo from Da Vinci of the moon. <laughs> from from the moon. <laughs> oh my God! You butchered it. All of it. It's dead. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, why why don't you want to write the prequel, man? I'm not gonna get off this topic. We yeah. only want a full length novel, Rob. I mean, yeah. it isn't a big ask. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> in a way, it would be quite a good idea if I wrote a really dud story, or if one of us wrote a really dud story, because. If we go on appreciating each other's stories like we're doing and saying nice things about them, the viewers are going to start getting suspicious that, that Roller for Tangent is, is merely a mutual admiration society. I, I, I wasn't... I, I wasn't, thought it was. I wasn't hmm? aware that I was uh, unconditionally being no, uh, no. upbeat about this. I mean, I, um, I basically said that it was very confusing for me in the beginning. What I'm saying is somebody should write a story that's absolute garbage. <laughs> the others should... Oh, I, can I volunteer for that. Yeah, I I no, no, me first, me first. <laughs> no, me first. I can write it. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess we'll, we'll get to that when it's the story child's <laughs> race. No, I'm kidding. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, you know like what? I'll try, to find, poetry. Mm. I'll try to find like a terrible story I wrote as a teenager. Let's see. Mm. Uh, I'm sure I'll find something awful. Oh, I'll yeah. find things for sure. Mm. Yeah, it's it oh, might terrible. be like that film, the producers, you know, where they they try and uh, find a, a dud play and and, and it <laughs> was it Hitler in springtime or wasn't yeah. it from the yeah springtime for Hitler? Yeah, yeah. For Hitler. yeah right, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Maybe we'll okay, do like so... a like a trio. Like we'll take these three really bad stories that are all written and do so, like an episode, so, like a so, three episode. Uh, so maybe the we we could we could we could change the short story challenge around to how to write a bad story. In... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what an interesting you just want to win the competition, yeah? Right? <laughs> yeah I to totally do. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say something though. I mean, in in all seriousness, that um, actually, as a as a as a practicing artist, after a while, it's hard work to actually do deliberately do bad drawings. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I I really have to I actually have to emphasize that because so so for instance, uh. For me now to draw the way children do, for instance, is hard. It is hard. Yeah. Mm. Right. Mm. yeah. All you got to do actually is just read one of my first drafts and pff, there you go. Bad bad mm. writing. I, I can guarantee it. No, no, no. Okay, that's that's yeah. uh that's uh that's like a cop out. You have to actually sit down and write a bad one. No, all my first drops are pretty crappy, actually. Okay. Yeah. Another another point about badness, which is not what we write, but what other people write. <laughs> yes, that's why everybody else writes. Yeah. yeah no, that you know, uh, when an author does something really well, others kind of congregate like vultures and try and get in on the act and write pastiches. So, for example, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom books spawned a lot of imitations, and the, the Conan stories probably spawned a lot of imitations, and also people trying to fill the gaps like Elsprague de Camp and Lynn Carter, trying to fill complete Howard's unfinished manuscripts for him and so on. And it would be interesting someday to do a really detailed analysis of, of these failures and find and try and pinpoint what Howard has got that his imitators don't have or what Burroughs has got that his imitators don't have. Mm -hmm. It's it's like trying to isolate a a substance, you know, the, the, the Philosopher's Stone or something, a, 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 a kind of life principle. It's like Dr. Frankenstein trying to find the prince principle of life in his laboratory it, it's a it's a mysterious quest 
Oh, I know one thing because I have read those sorts of stories and some of them have not worked and I've wondered why. And I think um, it was uh, it was one of the Harry Harrison series that other writers took up. I can't remember whether it was Build a Galactic Hero or the Stainless Steel Rat series, which is mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorites. And um, and I was reading through it and I was like, why, why wasn't this this sequel working right why wasn't this continuation of the series working and it occurred to me it was because the writers wanted to show just how authentic it was so they kept on hitting you over the head with the same terms you know like syrian panther sweat and syrian panther sweat had to come in every second chapter for example right whereas when harrison wrote his stainless steel rat stories and, I, and i'm just you know making an example out of this it, it's i'm not necessarily saying this is the series i'm talking about but when uh, when harrison used to write it he he used to just mention syrian panther sweat once in a novel but you know these guys try to want to outdo harry harrison so they just tend to right. just like repeat repeat the the things that they know the style right mm -hmm. the terms the language the sentence construction that you sort of thought oh that is pure you know howard or harrison or whomever and they just tend to to really use it to death in the mm -hmm. space of of one work of fiction they just can't leave enough alone and for me that was the one thing and eventually it ended up being a wall banger as well because i thought oh my god i can't stand this it's just not subtle enough yeah mm -hmm. uh, and so i found that that was one of the issues that these these follow-up writers yes one of the the right. mistakes these follow-up writers tend to make mm -hmm. in uh in my experience because I work in the industry of follow-ups uh, mm -hmm. it usually takes a takes a whole team of people to deconstruct and skillfully repurpose um, a uh, the word as escaped as escapes me but um, like a, 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 a concept that had been successful that was successful before and then it would it normally takes a team to deconstruct and then skillfully put it back together in another way, another form that's not an exact copy of the first. Um, but uh, when it is done very skillfully, um, it perpetuates the uh, the success from before in an extremely profitable way. It, it mm. can it can happen. Uh, it takes a lot of it takes some iterations and it takes a lot of money up front to do it though yeah right. i was in uh i was working in a in an animation house in japan who the, one of their biggest franchise is uh is a is is basically a deconstruction of uh, sailor moon but put together in another way and i got to watch up close how they actually do it and i have to say like yeah, they are um, their finger on the pulse was so tight uh, and so disciplined that uh, 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 it was it was quite uh, marvel to to watch and be in the process uh, seeing how all that came about. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's a. Uh, it's a skill it's a it's a skill all of his own uh not i think not one that uh, most people would uh would uh, immediately recognize because uh i mean mcdonald's probably spend billions of dollars to make sure that their food tastes exactly the same everywhere and that takes a lot of effort mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. yeah but most people wouldn't appreciate that sort of effort mm. i suppose yeah mm. anyway i don't know where i was going with that but uh that's uh that's that's the soul of this podcast <laughs> mm. it ought to be possible to do successful pastiches if like me you believe that authors good authors actually are good because they are accessing something it's like sitting on top of an oil well or a, or a mine you, you you dig and you find this thing that you you just have the good luck to be sitting on top of 
Now, theoretically, somebody else could come along, push you out of the way, and and dig the same oil well or the same mine. You see what I mean? If it's something exte- exterior to to the author, or or at least you know you're accessing some dimension of reality, then anyone ought to be able to do it. Hmm. Anyway, I mean. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, XJ. Just, uh, yes, I did that. I mean, I did the pastiche of uh, Ian M. Banks's culture universe, right? But I kind of like changed it a little bit because I just loved the universe so much. And I basically wanted, I thought, this is this is such a great foundation to write some stories in. Mm. But of course, I can't write any culture novels because I, I would be breaking copyright. But mm. if I change maybe this, this, and this and keep the rest <laughs> of it, right okay then i can turn it into into my own universe and that's what i did and i decided to call it the fusion and i wrote and you know and i remember one reviewer saying oh well this is just like an ian m banks novel and i'm going yes and <laughs> right because people people do it all the time you know as we mentioned you know you've got people writing conan type novels and they you know if it if it appeals to people and people are, are are inspired by it then then they will want to create within that if not exactly the same but in a similar kind of universe mm. similar playground so yeah i'll cop to that i've done i've done that Yes, yes, readers. I've hey, I mean, uh, imitation is the uh, sincerest, sincerest form of form flattery. Of flattery. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It, Absolutely. I, and it depends. Look, not every single author, like uh, this is something I want to pass on the viewers as well, pass on to them. Um, you know, not every, not every writer is the same. Not every author is the same. We have all very right. different associations with like how to write something, what to write, how how should it feel, what what kind of an energy it has, um, mm. what kind of goal we have in our mind when we write something, you know. Some people write out of love, though usually those people write poems. Right? Some people write out of anger and frustration and a terrible life that has occurred to and them. And that's horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then or some comedy. some people uh, you know, they they author something uh, because they just need to express themselves because they've had enough. Um, there's many, many, many different reasons as to why a person writes. So, you know, sometimes the, the work itself uh, doesn't even need to be good in order to be valuable. Mm. But you, that doesn't, you know, like, that may sound like a very peaceful solution to the war. But also it's kind of... Um, you wouldn't be able to tell what's a good story if you've never read a bad story. I mean, mm. Ed Wood Jr. has a place in film history and all of his movies are horrible. <laughs> do you, do, do, uh, do you, do any, any of you heard of uh, Ed Wood Jr. before? No. No? Mm-hmm. Plan 9 mm-hmm. from Outer Space? No. Oh, my oh, God. Yes. yes. That I know. Yeah, yes. I know. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. I thought it was Ed, Ed something. Ed, Ed, Ed Wood? Ed Wood. Ed, Ed Wood. Wood. Yeah. I think it's Ed Wood. Yeah. But, yeah. Ed Wood. Ah, okay. Yeah. Ed, Ed, okay. Ed Wood or Ed Woods? Yeah, I know Ed yeah, Woods. Yeah, Ed Woods, I thought. Ed yeah, Woods. yeah. yeah. Well, doesn't matter. Plan, I know that Plan, Nine, Plan 9 from Outer Space has its, uh, yeah, has yeah. its place in film history. Well, the thing is that yeah. the man the man went on to write pornography after he stopped doing like normal uh, movies. Oh, that's so he he continued to know. create he continued to create schlock for the rest of his life, oh, he, okay. and he loved it. He loved every single moment of it, and he had Speaking. no shame. <laughs> like, so yeah. he was a great dude. Go on. I, I was going to say, speaking of loving every minute of it, mm. should give Rob <laughs> his prompt. Because he's yes. going oh, to right. love, I, he's I was, going to love yeah. every minute of it. Oh yes, yeah. uh, right next day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, Rob, Rob, this is this the one. Is, you are going wait, to have so much fun. You should. You should you, we should tell the, the 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 viewers what we're doing. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay, viewers, as you know, we <laughs> give a prompt, <laughs> a prompt to uh, to each one of the the members. I I had mine week and now rob shall be given his prompt he hasn't heard of it before the three of us got together and came up with something to give to rob rob has three weeks is it yeah guys three three weeks three Three weeks weeks, to come up with a short story yeah three weeks to come up with a short story 2500 words all right okay 
And um, here is your prompt, Robert Dunn. <laughs> and it is Dateline, May 1943. Shock discovery. Japanese body found in London barracks. I shall put it in the chat. There we go. You now have it officially. <laughs> it has been handed to you, sir. <laughs> it has been handed. That's right. Yes, it has been handed to you, sir. Right, right, right. Very okay. well. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay. That's and that's what that's what they came up with. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, Robert, I will take I will take uh, responsibility for I I have had a certain part in this, but I will exonerate XJ. XJ had nothing. <laughs> like, what? You can try to make it worse for you. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to be honest and say that I don't actually remember much of the meeting. <laughs> I just remember we came up with something that uh, Rob would uh, love. Hopefully. Yeah, Rob, we, what do you have to say, Rob? Would, would be a wonderful people. challenge for you, darling. Yes, yes. Uh, I can uh, I can see how uh, I'm going to approach this, actually. Yes. Oh, okay. We should have made it harder. Oh, you see? <laughs> <laughs> so... <clears throat> the true angels of the of the podcast, always trying to look out for the others. And then... Like, you know, I mean... It, and then you stab us. I'm not an angel. So and I like... Not being an angel. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I mean, right? As much as I am Galadal, I'm I'm also a, a bit of a row. <laughs> right, yeah, and you, but mostly you're the Rock of Shana. Somebody who did watch the last episode will be like, "What are they talking about? Does it make any? What is the yeah, Rock so, of Shana?" So, so if, if anyone is confused, I very much urge you to go. <laughs> <laughs> watch the uh, previous episode absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah and then all the other ones and then you know link them to yeah. your family and then your friends yeah it's spread it far and spread wide. It as a virus yeah. yes that's right mm. all right panspermia now, now yes now that we have uh, handed over the uh, challenge to rob um we have came to the yeah. end of the podcast unless any one of you have something to add we, we should say what, what we're reviewing next week Oh, the Twonky, isn't it? Yeah, by Henry uh, Cutner. No, by it, it was Henry Cutner, yeah. And C. Yeah. L. Moore. And C. L. Moore. Mm -hmm. And C. L. Moore. Yeah, both of them wrote that story. They were married, yeah. weren't they? But, yes, uh, yes. Husband and wife team. Yeah, which is uh, nice Very interesting uh, uh, combination. And right. Can you have the link to that story, uh, please? I know we already had it some time ago, but... Yeah, yes. I'll... I'll You'll, you'll see it. I'll figure it out. Oh, yeah. thank you, Nikki. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is really interesting was is that how how contemporary the um, the theme is behind the Twonky. <clears throat> mm. right. Well, let's not spoil the thing any further. Um, <laughs> all right. Shall we sign off? Yeah? No more words? Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, if you disagree with us uh, or agree with us, please leave a comment. Um, like, subscribe, and all that jazz. Yeah. See you all. Take Bye care, guys. All. Bye -bye. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye.